Victor Hugo's Les Miserables has been adapted several times on both the stage and screen. I'm Zach Laws of Gold Derby, and here with me now is John Murphy. He's a composer, and he's working on the latest uh, version of Les Miserables. It's a six-part miniseries on PBS. And John, uh, you know, this thing has been done so many times as films and, and TV shows and, uh, of course, the famous stage musical. So, I mean, when you get... Uh, contacted about doing another version of it, like what do you do uh, to distinguish it uh, from from other versions? Well, for me, um, it it was more of a personal thing. I've never actually seen the musical, to be honest. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, I think I might be the only person in the world who's never seen the musical. Um, but I read the book in my early twenties. Um, I used to be a session player, so I used to tour a lot. So I would. You know, I'd spend months on a tour bus sitting in a little bunk and I'd always take loads of books to books with me. Um, and we were doing a European tour and what, one summer I took Les Miserables with me. Um, and I just loved it. I thought it was a, you know, aside from all the the big universal themes and, and everything else that goes with it, all the great noble ideas, you know, it's actually a great story. It's just a great story and it's got everything. And I just love the book. Um, and then about 10 years later, for whatever reason, I, I just decided to read it again. So I knew that I knew the book really well. M maybe that's why I never went to see the musical because I just didn't really want to be disappointed because it was such a different context in a different, in a different adaptation. So it was a personal thing for me. And so when the call came in, um, my agent rang me and said, are you interested in doing this? Because he didn't actually think I would want to do it. Because it's not really, I think the kind of films that I've I'd done before I took my break, you know, I had like a long hiatus. They weren't really that kind of historical epic sort of movie. I wasn't really doing stuff like that. Um, but for me, it, it, it made it more of a reason to do it because, it, you know, I didn't really want to come back and, you know, pick up pick up where I left off. You know, the big dirty epic wall of sound stuff I was doing. So that was an, an extra incentive for me because it was something that people wouldn't really have expected me to do. So between that and between loving the the original novel, um, it was easy to say, I want to do it. I didn't really care about the musical. And when I spoke to um, Tom Shanklin, the director, and Chris Carey. Um, they were so passionate about this and they made it very clear that, that they wanted to go back to the source. This had nothing to do with not only the musical, but it had nothing to do with other adaptations of this story. So by the time I'd finished speaking with them, it was clear to me that, that you know, this was a worthwhile thing to do. And all the other, just because something has had a dozen other versions of it, you know, it doesn't mean to say the original idea itself isn't still wonderful it's like you know there's a thousand versions of yesterday it doesn't make yesterday a bad song so um and then i didn't really think about the musical after that you know there was it was such a different thing we were trying to do um it just became another story with characters and themes and and development and it was just another challenge so I didn't really worry too much about all these other versions. This was going to be our version, and I just threw myself into it. I guess it makes it a lot easier not having to, you know, worry about competing with the score of the musical if you've never even like seen it. So it was actually a lifesaver because people were saying to me, "Oh, so was it going to have this song?" And I would say, "What song?" You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was like I was. I mean, in some ways, I was the perfect guy to do this because I had no. Um, preconceived ideas and of course um when you're not aware of of the other version the big musical you know um there's no pressure because um you're not feeling like you're competing with something although there was one moment which was i think there was one moment where it hit me when i first got the got episode one and i'd seen a bit of the rushes and i'd seen a few bits and pieces but they sent me episode one and I sat down and I thought, I'm going to watch this. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to feel it. And then the words came up, you know, the, those two iconic, famous words. And I think I went, oh, 
why does it say Les Miserables? You know, it was just that sort of reality check for a moment. And then I was like, okay, don't think about it. Just do your own thing. So, um, so I think my ignorance got me through it, you know. It was unavoidable for me. I went to a high school that did a production of the uh, show. So I heard those songs over <laughs> and over again. <laughs> but I'll tell you, you know, watching this version, um, you know, it, it does not um, recall memories of that. Um, certainly the characters and the situations are all the same. But, you know, you guys really do do a good job of creating something that is um, unique from the other versions. So I guess I just wonder musically, like, what were your initial ideas um, for this? Well, when I knew I was doing this, I went over to London and I was lucky enough to sit in on the read-through, which is something I've never, ever done before. So... I was in this big room with all of the actors and I kind of sat, you know, away a little bit and just watched them read through all six episodes. It took the whole day. Um, and just, just being there, you know, even though they were just sitting there in jeans and sneakers and sort of reading words from page for the first time, I, I really got a sense of... Um, you get a great sense of the story because, you know, it was written by Andrew Davis or the adaptation was by Andrew Davis. He was just, you know, he's the don at this stuff. He's brilliant. So everything was very, um, very entertaining and it was, it was fast and it was, so I've got a great sense of the story, but what I didn't expect was um, to get a sense of the characters and, or at least the way that these characters were going to be portrayed in this adaptation. So, you know, we'd have David Yellowo sitting a few seats away from me and just watching him sort of his posture and this delivery, this very calculated, you know, even though he wasn't filming this, you could see that in his mind, this was how he was going to portray this character. And then you had Dominic West and this big sort of peasant. And he had this very overbearing, but kind of humble, persona to him and he delivered his stuff in this way and then Lily Collins was this so I really got a sense of how it was going to be even before they shot this and that started giving me ideas um and I think by having not seen the musical you know I basically had a blank slate or a blank page and then after that read through the next day I sat down with um Tom and Chris and and, and we talked about ways to do this and they made it very clear that you know, even though this is such a famous historic, you know, sort of adaptation of this story, um, we want this to be our own thing. So we just threw ideas out and my <laughs> my original idea, which I, I'm amazed didn't get me fired on the spot, um, or one of them was, you know, Tom, the director, made such a thing about he wanted this to be down and dirty, you know, not quite in tune, rough, primitive, you know, very, um, you know, warts and all. And I had an idea for for doing it like um, a sort of 1816 Velvet Underground because I sort of love the Velvets and I just thought that one might be a very cool way of putting a modern spin on this but would still encompass all of those ideas of very laconic and, you know, I just heard it, you know. it To me, it felt right. Um, so they didn't find me on the spot. And then Tom said, well, what if we mix that in with, because um, he really liked the idea of using a lot of the folk instruments of the day. You know, even though we didn't want to make it a, a folk score, you know, he he brought up a lot of instruments like Hardy Gerdy and all of these things I'd never used before. And I thought, well, okay, well, we'll try mixing some of that in. Um, and then Chris had the idea for using some old analog synths and, you know, old moves and stuff. And, so there was this kind of horrible mix of ideas, you know, which should have been appalling. Um, but when I went back to LA and I started playing with some stuff, what I found quite quickly was that some of the mix of these things um, was working really interesting. Um, you know, so it, it kind of felt worth pursuing. So I ended up just trying different things out. So there's some velvety guitar in there there's some old moogs and stuff in there there's an old prophet i i mixed up hairdy gaydies with you know a few synths and then guitars and then we had like a very velvety sort of 
you know, side drum, which was pounding through a lot of stuff. So, you know, when it worked, it was great. When it didn't work, it was horrible. But we sort of, um, it was a bit of an experiment, to be honest. And then for some of the, what I realized too was that, you know, I hadn't really accounted for some of the very lighter moments and some of the, you know, just, you know, there's the whole love thing. And I didn't want to have this all dark because, you know, you need light to see the dark. So, and for that, I thought it, it might be cool to throw in a little bit of, um, you know, the sort of classic 60s French lyricism, that sort of very romantic sort of movie score stuff. And that worked really well. So there was all these very disparate ideas. Um, but I basically had four kind of pots to, to sort of pick from. And I was just messing around, having fun, trying things out. And, you know, it was, it, I think it worked. And they all seem happy. So, um, but that's how it kind of came about. So there was no perfect vision. It was just a load of ideas and, and what worked, worked. You're just picking and choosing from all kinds of different musical inspirations and then just like mixing them together. That's, that's yeah, so I mean, interesting. I, I love to do that anyway. You know, I, I, I'm not a classically trained musician. I taught myself to play the instruments that I play. Um, you know, I'm from Boodle in Liverpool. There's not a lot of conservatoires there. So I just learned the, you know, on the streets, you know, I, I played in pubs and my dad was a singer and a guitarist. So I just came from that route and I ended up being a songwriter, going on tour with bands. So, you know, I went around the other side, so to speak. So for me, mixing things up was always um, where it got interesting for me. So it's it's natural for me to do that. I'm kind of sacrilegious. To me, it's all the same thing, whether it's the Stranglers or it's Bark or it's Monteverdi or it's the Sex Pistols. or it's, To me, it's all music and it's all emotion. So I've got no problem mixing that stuff up and just seeing what works. Um, and, and to be honest, my favorite film composer is probably Ennio Morricone. Mm. And he was the master of taking unlikely ideas and, and mixing them together. You know, the spaghetti westerns with, you got a bit of Italian opera with a 60s electric guitar and, you know, and then South American instruments. It's like, what's that got to do with the Wild West? You know, but it, it worked wonderfully and, and it worked magically. So for me, mixing things up is my my first instinct. So it worked out. I just want to ask you something about the workload of this, because I mean, you've done a lot of feature films um, and this is basically like a six hour feature oh, film. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, composing that sheer amount of music um, and, you know, being able to, I guess, sustain a score for that long, was that a challenge? That was the the, yeah, I wouldn't say the only challenge, but I would say for me that was um, the biggest challenge. Because, you know, on a movie, you know, I may be writing 40 cues, maybe 40 minutes of music, depending on if there's no songs in the movie, like it's a horror movie or something, then I might do 50 minutes or, or even 60 minutes. But usually you're doing 45 minutes or something. And I might get two months or three months to do it. So looking back, I didn't know how easy I had it, you know. But on this, it was very different. And I've never really done television before. I've done a few documentaries for a friend of mine, but I've never done anything that was a series or it was this, this long. Um, so what I did um, while they were shooting, because I'd been told that when the episodes come to me, I'd literally be getting just a couple of weeks for each episode. Uh, while they were shooting, I just noodled about and, and I worked from the script. So I had all the scripts, so I would just read the scripts and sit at the piano. And if I felt something for Fontaine or for Valjean, I, I would just start sort of writing themes from that, um, which is actually a thousand times more creative than writing to picture, because when you write to picture, you're instantly constrained. You know, you've got to go from there to there, and sometimes you've got to go quicker there, and you've got to stop there. So nothing has a chance to really develop or flower musically. But when you're writing from the script, you're just writing ideas. So, you know, I had that time to just build up this part of, you know, I wrote a few things for Valjean, a few things for Javert, and and then I was thinking about situations. I knew there was a chase scene. I knew there was a there was the battle scenes to come at the end. There was this love story which I had to accommodate. So, you know, I was writing things that I could go to when the time came, which was 
you know, which ended up being a lifesaver because there ended up being much more music in each episode. I think there was like 45, 50 minutes of music per episode. And I would get, you know, I think 15 to 20 days for each one, which is just enough time to, you know, work in what you've written and then record the the real players, mix it, do rewrites. So from the point of getting the first episode, it was just like slogging it, you know. So that was difficult, but we got there. Well, you certainly pulled it off. Uh, it's a great adaptation of the book and a uh, wonderful score as well. John thank Murphy, you. thank you so much for your time and congratulations on your work. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Zach. Thank you. And thanks to all of you at home for watching. Make sure you hit the subscribe button below and make sure you visit us at goldderby.com for all the latest Emmy news and to make your predictions.